And because of the relationship that uh, which now seems to, to show up as a common theme or paradigm in condensed matter physics, that superconductivity, the high temperature superconductivity is lying near or in proximity to a phase which has some other type of order. Uh, in, in these two cases, antiferromagnetic order in the uh, cuprates uh, and in the iron-based uh, uh, superconductors. And so, of course, what we really like to be able to do is what everyone wants us to do is to train a generation of theorists who can calculate TC and have it be actually meaningful. Um, and so to be able to do that, we need to understand what are the recipes that, that go into it, what are the essential points, is there a common theme, meaning proximity to another phase, or do the details really matter and we're going to have to do a new theory for every single compound that comes, comes around. So in looking at, uh, this is a, a, just a, a comparison that Igor put together, Igor Mazin, um, uh, which is looking at uh, certain types of properties, comparing the conventional superconductors, copper oxide, NGB2, and iron-based superconductors. And of course, they have more in common than just the high transition temperatures themselves. Um, there are aspects connected with, this, with structure of two-dimensionality, three-dimensionality, whether it's the uh, lattice that's driving things or magnetic, of course, nothing is uh, uh, written in stone yet, but there certainly is a uh, direction people are leaning. And the way of looking at an order parameter is, is different in, say, single band materials as it could be in, uh, uh, within single band materials or within multi band materials. So this is the kind of stuff that I want to try to, uh, try to at least think during the lectures of what's interesting and, and how can we really focus on what the details are. So here's the phase diagram of the uh, A phase diagram of the nickel superconductors. They like proximate to an antiferromagnetic magnetic uh, uh, state at zero doping. So in their stoichiometric uh, configuration, which is the same as the cuprates, they're antiferromagnetic at zero doping. But the big difference is, of course, that this is an antiferromagnetic metal at zero doping, and this is an antiferromagnetic insulator. And one changes doping by a chemical substitution, usually. Uh, it can be done with pressure or, or other means as well. And magnet magnetism goes away, and as magnetism goes away, then, then superconductivity emerges uh, uh, in close proximity. And if one continues to dope, then you know, superconductivity comes back down again. So this is much more of a stretch uh, region of superconductivity. Uh, this is more like a parabola apart from some charge ordering effects here around uh, 1 8 doping or so. And these materials share similarities in that they're both essentially square lattices of uh, transition metal ion, copper in the cuprates and iron in the nictides. And, and of course, I should make a, a, a disclaimer. I use nictides rather loosely. It has a specific meaning as to what actually makes up the material that we're looking at. So just whenever I say nictides, then just think iron is somehow involved in this <laughs> um, And there's a, there's a, uh, so it's essentially a square, square lattice, the transition metal ions, and then there's ligands in between, in this case oxygen, in this case arsenic, which are more or less sitting uh, at symmetry points of the lattice. The arsenics are a little bit uh, tilted outside of the plane and the oxygens are, are not. Um, so that's the way things are similar and the, which, the way things are, are different, of course, there's quite a lot that's going on. And this is the, the issue, is trying to look at these differences and say which are the ones that are essential? Which are the ones that we really have to focus on? So this is what I said about the insulating versus metallic parent state, antiferromagnetic state. Single bands having a Fermi level, to, there's of course many, there's uh, bilayer effects and so on in the cuprates, but uh, I'm leaving that, that's a complete another subject for a talk. Um, where the nictides are always multiband contributions. There's interesting three dimensionality effects uh, that's revealed, say, in photo emission and the osmonality and so on. Um, there's good signs of, of a magnetic interaction, but I, this is a point that I want to stress is that the interaction here is super exchange in the cuprates, and here I believe, to my taste, that that's more connected with Hunt's coupling, as I'll discuss a little later on. Um, here we definitely have spin half moments that are reduced by quantum fluctuations, and here it's very variable, the magnitude of the moments. 
Um, we have a, a, a looks like a spin density wave of collinear antiferro magnetism, and this one is a checkerboard or some uh, interpenetrating lattice of antiferro magnetism. Uh, crystal field splitting is something that I'll come to, and of course the topic of this conference are are the orbital degrees of freedom relevant or not? Can we reduce everything so that here we can just map them onto the problem of the crudkits with some type of reduced effective model that looks similar and captures superconductivity in both? That would be really nice. Okay, so some basics uh, about iron. I think uh, Yurin already already uh, indicated this that its, its electron configuration is the uh, the ion, ion itself that's argon and then valence electrons 3d6 4s2 which gets stripped off when it goes into a solid and it goes to the oxidation states there are many but the most common are the ones which is iron 2 plus like in the iron uh, iron nictides and iron 3 plus and hematite so you know i was thinking on the way from the airport when i was holding on and my knuckles were turning red white and i was thinking my life was flashing before my eyes <laughs> That one of the things that I would like to try to do is to try to uh, uh, perhaps get you to think about this guy, hematite, this is everywhere, it's even on Mars. Uh, why is this one an insulator, an antiferromagnetic insulator? And why is this one, iron 2 plus, a superconductor? If you can answer that question, then, then I wouldn't feel so bad about crashing on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is the general lattice structures. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll probably hear a lot more of, more of that. So this is zooming in, or zooming out, I should say, on the common features of having the uh, iron arsenic planes. Here's the iron with the arsenic above and below the iron planes, which are common. Uh, in these classes of materials, which unfortunately have these terrible names of 1111 and 111 and 122. This is a tongue twister. I, someone was was using 1111, I think that's much better. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the uh, calcogenides uh, uh, it just replaced this just further down on the periodic table, taking selenium and putting it in for arsenic. Again, they share a common structure. And then there's some spacer ions which are lying in between. So here, just to show you that, I know what a comicogen and a calcogen is. Here it is. So I uh, can uh, now be loose and sloppy. Okay, and if we again look at the structural comparison of the uh, of the cuprates, it looks similar in the in the sense that there's a copper oxygen plane separated by some spacer ions, but there's not a large degree of buckling as there is in the in the uh, in, in nictides. So the nictides form these uh, inverted uh, octahedra uh, uh, tetragonal structure, um, where it's, it, there is some degree of buckling in here, but it's usually very very small. So dimensionally, they look similar. Um, now, if we consider valence considerations, now we have, well, now we start to see where the orbital degrees of freedom are really manifest. So in the barium iron arsenic, so that's iron two plus means there's three six, uh, uh, sorry six three D electrons that we have to put in into the into our states, and we have many different ways to do that. So sometimes it's easier to talk about electrons or talk about holes depending how you do things, but there are many configurations of which you could draw uh, uh, a total of six electrons, spin up, spin down, in equal spin sectors, or uh, a balance of one or a balance of another. And that's very different compared to the cuprates, where this is their parent antiferromagnetic insulator, argon, that's the ion, and then the 3D10 4S1 goes in as 2 plus, which means the 4S goes and one of the uh, uh, 3D electrons go. And so then what we're left with is really only with these two configurations. We just have uh, one spot where we can put the, put the uh, hole or leave the one electron out. And that can be distributed at any of the different orbitals. But we'll see the crystal field actually is the one that selects where that hole eventually goes. So here are those orbitals. Uh, and this is the way in which you can think about how the different role of those orbital degrees of freedom can be manifest. So if we have copper, that means we're going to fill up all of these orbitals except for one. And if we have iron, that means we have a lot of degrees of freedom in which we can distribute the electrons. You want to calculate it, well, you just count the number of electrons that you want to put in of upspin and the number of electrons you have in downspin. 
and so that this is five, five chews and up times five chews and down, and that gives you the total number of permutations that you can put in. So for 3D6, if I have n up a five and down a, a one, there are only five permutations, so where that extra upspin or downspin goes. But if I have equal numbers of up and down spins, I have 100 permutations that are possible. So that there's a lot of degree of freedom in this case. If I have just 3D9, I only have five permutations. I can put the whole here, 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 and that's it. Same up or same down. So and in spherical systems, um, uh, all of these orbitals will be degenerate. It only depends on the quantum number n, as Jeroen pointed out. And so all of those orbitals, all of these distributions would be roughly equivalent. So, but if you take these orbitals, you take these atoms, you put them into a lattice, then they feel the crystal field which is coming from all of the other atoms that are sitting in the lattice. And that crystal field breaks the symmetry, breaks them generously. So if you take it out of a single atom by itself in a vacuum, so that's spherical symmetry, I can rotate any orbital into any other orbital and still get the same thing. But if I put it in a cubic system which specifies x, y, and z in discrete rotations, then I break the symmetry into t2g orbitals and e2g orbitals, as you already said. And then if I take them once again and I put them into tet tetragonal, so I make a, a, and c, rather than a, a, and a, then I split the levels again. And the magnitude of, this, of these splittings, of these degeneracies, is unfortunately called 10 to Q. Why 10 and not 9? Doesn't matter, usually it's 6 and 4, but uh, that's just historical. Um, but these are the guys which tell me now uh, of the difference between, between taking the atom in a vacuum and putting it into a crystal and seeing how the energy levels split. So these crystal field levels, as I said, are coming from the electrostatic interaction from all the other atoms. So that's a big energy. That's Madeline energy. Madeline energy is the energy of buying the lattice together. But because the lattice is actually a stable thing, meaning I kick it and it still stays to be the lattice, the differences in the different sites that you see electrostatically actually is not all that big. So really, the crystal field levels themselves are not split by a very large amount. It's only when you allow those electrons that are sitting on that transition metal ion to go and hybridize with the surrounding, say, oxygen or, or arsenic, the <coughs> ligands, that those crystal field levels will, will split, those, those energy levels will split anymore. That's called ligand field splitting. And so typically, then, this 10 dq depends, depends very much on the lattice, depends very much on the distance between uh, the atoms that are sitting in there and also depends upon what atom type of atoms you're looking at. But typically it's um, not more than an electron volt or so for many transition metal materials. So that's not a big energy compared to a Madelung energy, but it's a tremendous energy compared to superconductivity, for example. So that this becomes the way in which then we start filling the electrons, uh, electrons up, which is just given by the overall environment that, uh, that the atom sits. So if you look at, uh, just take ion 2 plus, and look at the difference in energy of making high spin, which means I go uh, up, up, put all the up electrons here, and one down electron up there, and I compare them with low spin, which is all the up and down electrons together, that energy is given, of course, that, that crystal field energy, and so that is the, the uh, energy which stabilizes the low spin state. But of course, we have to worry about all the interatomic Coulomb interactions, not with the core. This was a question that came up earlier in the morning. The core gave all the atomic levels. That's now gone. Now I want to ask about the remaining valence electrons and how do they interact, the Coulomb interaction among the same electrons coming from the same orbitals. And that gives us all the wonderful Hubbard and Hunt's effects. So before I get to that, let me just uh, uh, point out that there is a difference that in many transition metal ox uh, oxides, such as the copper oxygen, uh, copper oxide system, we have an octahedral coordination, which is the transition metal uh, cation is sitting at the middle and it's surrounded in um, this octahedral coordination by the ligands, the oxygens. So that's different in iron and arsen iron arsenic so that the iron sits at the center and then the arsenics are sitting tetrahedrally coordinated. And so that means that these orbitals now, instead of pointing, say, along the principal crystal axes, they're rotating. 
in that, ro that rotation of tetrahedral coordination rather than octahedral inverts these levels. So in the cuprates, it, T2Gs are down here, EGs are up here, but in the nictides, it's flipped. So we first fill up the EG levels and then fill up the T2G levels. Okay? Okay. Um, are there any questions at this at this point? Oh, okay, good. So now I want to bring in the role of the Coulomb interactions. And again, I'm only looking at the Coulomb interactions which are involved the three D orbitals, not all of the other interactions of the, the nucleus, the protons, with the electrons that are forming the core. So there are two important things. This is the case of uh, just looking at the, the cuprates. There are two important energies. One is U which we heard about already, and the other is delta, which we haven't heard about yet. So U is, we take uh, a system of, of states, say copper D9, and we take one electron from one of them and we put it onto the other one. So we start with two D9s, and then we go to a D8 and a D10. So that energy is the electron ionization energy of copper and the electron uh, infinity, and that is what really U should tell us. And this number, if you don't worry about what's happening in the solid, if you just look at it atomically, is tremendous. It's not 16, that was the reduction. It's more like 25 electron volts or even, even larger. But that number gets affected by screening as your room put out, out or pointed out. And then the other is what's called the charge transfer energy. So that is looking at the ligand, in this case oxygen, and I move an electron from it onto the transition metal ion. So I go from a 2p6, that's the oxygen 2 minus D9 system, or, or local guy, to a 2p5 D10. And the difference in that energy is the ionization of the oxygen, <coughs> the affinity of the copper, plus whatever Madeline energy, uh -oh, whatever Madeline energy I have to pay as a site difference going from oxygen to copper. And so that led to, to the way in which you could uh, characterize insulators, where essentially one of these energy scales is bigger than the other. If you is greater than delta, or delta is greater than u, you have a mock of it of an insulator or a charge transfer insulator as pointed out in the original work of Hubbard, but of course this is the one that we all quote by Zion Swatsky now. So here is the part which I was very glad that Yarun started to cover. Now I'm going to tell all the experimentalists to kick your feet up and start thinking about fairies uh, swimming around in the water. So you're welcome to go have a little nap here. But uh, what I wanted just to, to point out is the route of which all of the multiplets come. I'm not going into detail. It's there on the slide, uh, hopefully, when it gets uploaded so you can go through it. So I'm just going to fly through this and, uh, and show where all of these interactions stem from. So here's this, the, uh, the kinetic energy part. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Here is the, the, all of the Coulomb part. And it's simple. It's just the Coulomb interaction and the density of electrons at site R prime and the density of electrons at site R. But of course, the, the electrons come from many places, many orbitals. And so I can represent that wave function as a complete uh, set of states which reflect the spin nature in terms of your electrons, so I just have these spinners. And then all of the orbital uh, pieces which come from um, some basis functions and some quantum numbers. So this, this is full blinding number of indices for you, but it's basically the radial part and the angular parts uh, connected, say, with uh, atomic orbitals. But we could use anything here that, that forms a complete, complete basis. It could be plane waves, it could be binary orbitals, anything that we want. And so because they depend on quantum numbers, you stick them in here and you get a mess. Okay? So here it is all in this blinding number of indices. So here is the CC data and CC. And then here is the Coulomb term, which is going to depend upon all of those indices, which is now the way in which we could write the, the generalized integral over the two space, the spaces R and R prime, of these basis elements connected by a Coulomb interaction. So I've got four sets of indices which are po possible. And so I have lots of terms. Okay? So I can expand the Coulomb interaction in whatever types of basis that I use. And then I have that this U, this interaction, can be written in terms of a radial integral and an angular integral 
over the radial part of our wave function. So here it is. This is notice this is a 3D wave function. It doesn't contain the core. Um, and there's all the angular parts. So this is where that book by uh, um, Griffiths comes in. If you ever wanted to know about Wigner 3J symbols, it's all in there. You can represent them all. And then you can connect them to condom parameters, the rocket parameters. That's all for the condom source. Uh, and then, so basically, um, you get to a form for the interaction, which depends on all of these coefficients. And there happen to be 625 of them, 5 2. Okay? Now, fortunately, a lot of these guys are zero, because I've got four different orbitals that can go in there. And so, let me just go through and explain what the pieces are. So, here I have a C dagger, C dagger of A and A prime. And then I have a CC of A double prime and A triple prime. But this, MS prime and MS prime are together. Those are the same indices. And then this, MS and MS are the same indices on the other side. So if all of these guys are the same, that means I'm looking at a density-density interaction of the same flavor. And that's what we uh, denote as the Hubbard view. Okay? Or if we have a, B, B, A, this is a density density interaction, but the two orbitals are not the same. So that is what's the, uh, what is denoted by U prime. And then we have A, B, A, B. This is taking C, C, dagger, C, dagger, C, dagger, C, C, and flipping them. So you're interchanging one on one orbital with one on the other orbital. So that's the Hunt's piece. And then there's uh, uh, another product, which is J, J prime. <coughs> A, which is another type of exchange that I'll get to. So the point is, is that there are a lot of parameters, a lot of coefficients, but they can group in terms of classes of parameters. And in fact, that a lot of these parameters are not free. We can pinpoint them and we know what they, what they can be from spectroscopy, which is much later on, hopefully, that I'll get to. So the bottom line is that, uh, I'm going to skip this. <laughs> the bottom line is now we have an interaction energy which likes to have the spins aligned. Okay, that's the Huns piece. You gain an energy whenever you have the electrons pointing the spin in the same direction. And if you look at, for example, iron 2 plus and look at just ignoring all of the other new new prime and just look at the Huns pieces, then you see that the energy difference between the uh, high spin state and low spin state is 4J. So here's the competition. If J is big, then you'll like to have a high spin state. If 10 dQ, or the crystal field energy is big, then you'd like to have a low spin state. And so this is uh, specified in these wonderful phenomenon Serrano diagrams. So these are all the energy levels for D6, single atom of D6, plotted as a function of 10 dQ. So as you go out, as 10 dQ comes out, you have first at zero, you'll have a high spin state as the ground state. And then eventually, there's lots of crossings that occur at the energy levels. And at some point, this is when 10 dQ wins, and the low spin becomes the ground state. And then all of the uh, energy levels, they just kind of go with 10 dQ. They don't, there's no more interactions among all of the different uh, permutations that you can get. So all of these types of excitations uh, are characterizable atomically. So you can see them by different types of transitions. And the big difference is for D6, there's a ton. And for D9, this is really trivial. All I can do is start from this being the ground state and just pop one of these things up into the other one, and that's it. And so the bottom line of this is that our Huns interaction favors a high spin state, large crystal field favors a low spin state. It's much different for copper than it is for iron 2 plus and these interaction parameters. So you'll have to take my word for it. I'll get to it later and we can be measured. OK, so this is kind of qualitatively the picture, is what we're looking at is a difference of having a large Huns energy compared to a small crystal field, but this will reflect seeing a high spin state. <coughs> or if we have the other way around, a, a large crystal field splitting compared to a Huns, <coughs> then we'll have a low spin state. So band theory would tell us, like I said, that the changes in the Madeline energy, the crystal field, the ligand splitting, not very large. And it's not probably less important than the 3D band structure, the kinetic energy that the electrons have. 
Um, and this is a very different view from the Kuprits, where really strong electron-electron interactions are very, very important. Okay, so five minutes. Okay. I think I'm going to have to speed up. So here's the form of the Hamiltonian that we have, uh, U, U prime. So these are all on the same site, but they involve the same orbitals, intraorbital and interorbital. Here's a Hunt's piece, and this piece is called a pair hopping term. So in what uh, ways can we neglect the next nearest neighbor interactions? Well, that's what you already really mentioned, that if we try to look at interactions where we're moving electrons from many sites away, the lattice has no way. I'm going to polarize uh, in order to, to screen away that, that D8 or the D10 that I created, for example. And this could be a huge effect at reducing the, the value of the Hubbard view. And in fact, because, again, as your room pointed out, the arsenic and the phosphorus are so big that this gives a pretty whopping uh, reduction in the Hubbard view on the order of about 17 electron volts or so as calculated by those guys uh, a, couple, a couple years ago. And essentially, that screening goes like the volume of the, of the weighted radius. Those so numbers are the reductions. The re this is the reduction, yeah. So atomically, this, these are 20 to 30 electron volts or so for copper oxide, less than ion arsenic. Okay, and in fact, somebody asked the question, that's how does that, how, do, how does the Huns and U change as you change the screening parameters? So these you can calculate, um, and that's what's plotted here. This is U up here, and this is J versus the screening wave vector. So as things become more metallic or better screening, you see the Hubbard interaction gets really, it comes down by quite a bit, whereas the Huns J doesn't change very much. And that's the difference between moving charge as opposed to just interchanging, interchanging that spin. So in this particular case, if we have arsenic as being a good polarizable material, we'd expect U to come down, but J to be relatively big if it's big in the atom. And so we might expect iron to be a Huns metal. Okay. So I've already said all of these, these things here. So what can we tell? So from LDA, uh, we can look at the line 8 orbitals that, uh, that emerge. And here is a work from Ola Anderson and Yuri Budori, which basically is, is confirming or giving that the states themselves uh, in near the Fermi level, around the Fermi level, are largely made up of uh, iron orbitals with some other orbitals which are sticking out. So it looks like that uh, iron D states might be a good way to start thinking about things with a little bit of arsenic. And if you look at the density of states as a function of energy, so you can see that here's the Fermi level. Most of the density of states is coming from the iron D. And there's a little bit of arsenic uh, 4P that's sitting there. The iron density of states is roughly as a bandwidth of about 4 electron volts or so. And then down here are the arsenic states, about 2.5 electron volts. So <coughs> this is uh, giving us the indication that iron is probably good, or arsenic is important, but iron states look like it is a good starting point. And um, by looking at the way that divides up from the orbitals, this is from uh, Peter's group of trying to orbitally project the density of states um, throughout the Brillouin zone. And so here you can see the inversion, EG and T2G, occupied, you know, the EG being occupied, T2G is up above, although they mix. Um, and you see you have near the gamma point, that's momentum zero, zero. You have these whole uh, pockets around gamma, and then M, that's around pi zero in the units, in the theorist's unit cell. So I'm going to give up on this thing. I'm going to go with the flexible. <laughs> <laughs> so that could be really big. <laughs> So that's an electron pocket which forms around the end point. And there's, there's also this terrible issue about the one ion versus two ion unit cell. And we just normally like to take this as being <laughs> Great. That's good. It's perfect for this slide, actually. I'm taking one ion as being the unit cell. But because arsenic is up and down, that makes things rotate. And so this is the one that we would like to take, that theorists love. This is unfortunately the real one. Um, and so here are the Fermi surface cuts, which come from LDA. These are the two are two of the uh, whole sheets sitting at the gamma point, and here are two of the electrons sheets sitting at the M&M bar. 
And if you look at the orbital makeup, this will be important. So you see that these beta sheets consist of yellow, that's DXY, and green, that's DYZ, and red, DXZ. So all T2G orbitals are contributing to those electron uh, hole particles. And then at the hole, I see just mostly green and green and red, but I know that there's a little bit of other things mixed in there as well, but largely green and red. So that's DYZ and DXZ. So again, T2Gs are being relevant, although there's other EGs which are in there as well. So we have a very orbital dependent Fermi surface. And if we want to build a theory based upon a Fermi surface, very good chance that orbital degrees of freedom are important. Am I out of time? Okay, forget about that. So, uh, yeah. Let me just uh, close with that, close with this, and then I'll pick, pick up again. So there are many different, the idea is that we can reduce something to an effective iron model. Now, there are many different ways in which that can be included. With just sitting in two bands, say electron and hole pockets, or three orbitals, which gets the T2G character in, or four if we want to see more orbital content, or work with the full five orbital model. And there are lots of different uh, 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 viewpoints of looking at that, and I think in the next lecture, I'll start to get into detail about what the different models or orbital models can tell us and what we can learn with the theory that's been done. And I'll stop. I have a question on the fifth equation of the first side. I was wondering about that. I think it's a square root of three. <laughs> something about the importance of the differentiation between U and U prime. Because yeah. that means that uh, if those could be very different, that would mean that the correlation would be more important in a band than in other one. Yeah. So exactly. can you say something about that? Well, you're, you're, as we say, reading my mail, because that's what's <laughs> going to happen next. Um, there is a relationship between U prime, U, and J. Okay, and of course, that's something that I'm going to try to draw out in the next lecture. Uh, sure. <laughs> that's very important. Can I, can I wait for until now? Yeah, yeah, I know. So that you're here tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Yeah. So in Cupid, you made an argument that <coughs> EG is close to the Fermi level, T2G is below. And that's because you have copper and surrounded by the apical oxygen. But that's only true for LSU, not in other families of key frames. But the band structure looks very much the same in all key frames. Well, you don't have oxygen, but you have chlorine, you have fluorine, you have lots of other things that are sitting there. So it's still in that uh, uh, yeah. octahedral symmetry. Most of them have an ethical. No. On LSU and in Montreal. I don't know what to call like that. Like NCCO to... Imperial is a name of the right? Yeah. The whole other one, so all are ethical. So, okay, so if you go to this, uh, this Takano diagram, right? so this little lines, right? Is a function of U and J and U. So this is why it's going to be both of us, right? Uh, yeah, no, they don't describe, they don't correspond to different orbitals. They can you repeat the structure? Oh. So in the Tanabi's Gunner diagram. Let's come back. Wrong way. Did I go the wrong way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. There you go. What a mess. I didn't read this. <coughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, so these are just the energy levels plotted versus 10 dq. 10 dq, okay? So the, the j and so on, that's, that's fixed. Okay, that's not changing. So that these are these correspond to all of the different uh, permutations that I, can, that I can do with all of those different electrons. And some of them have higher energy, some are at lower energy, and all of those permutations are there. So the 10 dq is dominant when you get out here, right? They all just go like 10 dq. But then out here, you're fighting the, the q and the u prime j and j prime. I have a couple of 
naive questions. First, uh, I, I missed the points of why is it important that PG and PG are reversed? It's not. It's just, um, it's just, it's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. Right. And, and then the second thing is, so finally, the fact that you have iron 2 plus in one case and 3 plus in the other. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you have systems with mixed valves, and I'm thinking about iron 304, right. yeah. would you expect something strange happening in the system? Yeah, well, tons of stuff happening in that system. Yeah. 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 transition happens in that thing, right? And mixed element systems, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, it's iron, iron silicon is a nice good example of, you know, kind of insulator piece. So there's a ton of physics bearing in mixed balance, and the connection, though, of that to superconductivity is, of course, another one of the bullet points that you could put in terms of common themes. Which are, is that important for superconductivity, or is it not? And I have a very big proponent who's just five doors down from me, Ed Duval, who thinks very important that, that it is very important that that mixed, that, that mixed balance is there. Is, so, that, is that a real mixed balance or a difference of balance on different sides? It's not exactly the same. Oh, I don't, I don't make the distinction yet. But there should. There is, of course. There is, of course. So, you know, just go down into the lamp and it happens in space. Yeah. If this is the same question as Henri's and you want to postpone it, feel free. But I'm curious about the screening of U prime relative to U. Is that the same question? This, uh, how is U prime right? screened relative to how U is screened? You showed us U and, and J ones, oh, but you didn't show us U prime. Yeah, that's uh, now where we go. So U prime is this one minus twice this one. In a spin rotationally invariant system, but yes. in general, can one say anything more general than that? Um, General. Well, it all then you, and, and if you break that hand waving, any hand waving about if I just interactions and so on that breaks, that's breaking that and that's that rotation symmetry and that relation. Gee, I don't know how that how if screening. I guess screening would, would be very diff, might be very different, but I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. It will be connected to D to the to the something, no? Because the way you would screen might depend also on the dimension. Yeah, and the charge transfer energy. But this, these, those are kind of sort of questions. Mm -hmm. I have another question after I woke up from the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, did I get it right that you said you can ignore the second neighbor interaction in this system? The, well, because the domain the of this and the Q phrase is that the second neighbor is very different, right? Right. We, we, I think look, this is a, something which I think is actually a very important question and I've just shot over it. Um, we, Focus on the local interaction. Why? Well, it's a big energy scale in the problem. But certainly, you know, when you're talking about electron volts or so, that next nearest neighbor interaction is not micro electron volts. It's certainly something that's substantial and it's there. Um, and in the, you know, theory does uh, 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 there are different ways that incorporate the non-local interactions and the, the ones which are extending over many sites. And we know. We know that's important. I mean, we wouldn't get a bigger crystal without it. So I mean, we know that there's a lot of pieces that are there that are important, and all well, like uh, that's a, that's a whole other whole other <coughs> thing. Here she no, is. Yeah, since this is a supercharge, and unlike in cuprates where it goes copper oxygen copper, this goes in the middle, right? So it goes yeah. to arsenic and the back. Right. So the next neighbor has the same path, except right. the angle. So your next neighbor technically is stronger than nearest neighbor. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that in the next lecture. Yeah, okay, yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, expected exchange. So the answer is definitely the next neighbor is important. Yeah, maybe I was thinking a little bit about the question about how U prime U screen differently, but I'm not sure but let's say the uh, the monopole screening is the same for both, right? The, the, the charge susceptibility mm -hmm. is, is mm -hmm. the same, mm -hmm. it's true in the same way. But they differ, the way they differ is in the quadrupole. Mm -hmm. So if there is a quadrupole susceptibility, mm -hmm. charge susceptibility different for one and for the other, then that screening will be different. So that, that's putting the problem towards susceptibility. <laughs> but, right. 
That's the way of thinking about it. And the screening will be doping dependent as well. Right? The screening is doping dependent as well because of the susceptibility. Oh, doping well, dependent. Yeah, but what I'm talking about is not about doping. Yeah, that right? is dependent. Just to be sure. So there's different, you know, there's the usual MGDAL type or, or uh, Dubai type of screening, and that's different from what I'm talking about. This is kind of canamory kind of screening, right? Yes. Did you say kind of work? Yeah, kind of work. Okay, so we'll let us thank Tom again. Move forward to.